Hey folks, uh, it is Dr. Gilchrist. I hope that you have had uh, a fantastic weekend. And uh, so now we're gonna move on uh, in lecture 26 to talk a little bit about some of these non-declarative types of memory. And we're also going to start talking about different types of uh, disorders and different types of injury that can end up disrupting uh, one's ability to learn and remember things. So we're going to talk about some um, things like traumatic brain injury and other things that can damage the hippocampus as well as the amygdala. Um, one thing that I will mention is, ahead of time is there are some images um, of brains that can be a little bit unsettling. Um, I will give you a heads up on when those are coming. So if you would like to look away, you are more than welcome to do so. So the last time that we were here, we were talking about a particular model of long-term memory. And we were talking about the major distinction between declarative or explicit memory, which requires conscious retrieval, and um, non-declarative or implicit memory. This does not require conscious retrieval. So with declarative, you demonstrate that you have the memory by telling somebody about it. That can either be uh, an episodic memory for an event that happened uh, at a particular point in time, or we have our semantic memory, which are basically memory for facts. Um, for example, uh, what is the capital of Missouri? Um, what is two plus two? Um, what are the different colors that make up a rainbow? So all of those are facts. Now, non-declarative memory, uh, you demonstrate that you have formed a memory by doing something. So that can include things like skills, priming, which we'll talk more about today, uh, conditioning, and perceptual learning. Um, declarative is often dependent upon uh, relational learning and is very complex. Um, as I kind of talked about last time, some people do not actually believe that episodic memory and semantic memory are actually separate from each other. And these people believe that really the only thing that differs from episodic Episodic memory versus semantic is that episodic memories still have a time-based component. Um, at some point, if you retrieve an episodic memory enough, these particular researchers believe that it will basically become a semantic memory over time. So implicit is unconscious. Um, so we already kind of talked about um, the stimulus response learning and instrumental learning. So that operant conditioning that is uh, often involved in our memories for skills. Um, as we kind of discussed already for the non-declarative forms of memory, there are distinct brain regions that support these forms of learning. Um, so different types of patients will exhibit different types of deficits. So somebody with impaired perceptual learning for faces like prosopagnosia does not have impaired fear conditioning. So now we're going to talk a little bit about priming. Um, I'm going to show you some words uh, very, very briefly. And don't worry if you can't get them all. Just try to focus on whatever you can. Okay, so now... The words were shown very quickly. Um, I'd like you to fill in uh, with the fill in these blanks with the first word that comes to mind. So I'll give you a minute to think of that word. Okay. Did you think of the word assassin? If you did think of the word assassin, odds are pretty good that you demonstrated some priming. And here's why. So here are the words that I briefly flashed upon the screen. Pyramid, Eskimo, Aardvark, Assassin, and Umbrella. And again, these were presented so quickly that some of you may not have even had a conscious memory of actually seeing the word assassin. But some part of your brain unconsciously registers that. And that's what priming is. Basically, what we find is that if we're briefly shown something, uh, even if it's not something we can consciously see, um, it does have a tendency to influence what words or ideas are more likely to pop into our mind. Now we're going to talk very briefly about skill learning. So, op so many of the different things that we've learned to do are, in fact, skills. So that includes things like driving a car, using a computer, 
um, recording a YouTube video. Um, so it's kind of hard. <clears throat> a lot of those skills are learned out in the world, and that sometimes makes them really difficult to study uh, within the context of a lab. So one of the ways that we actually try to do this um, we give people a skill in the laboratory that they probably would not be doing out in the real world. This is a case where somebody has to trace a figure, but they only have the mirror image of the figure to help them. Now, generally what we are going to find with people who are capable of learning new skills is that at least initially, this task is gonna be really, really difficult. But the more and the more that you do it, the easier the task becomes. You make less mistakes and you work more quickly. So these tasks are difficult at first and they require a lot of conscious processing. But over time, what we find is that they become very, very automatic. And this is one way that we can demonstrate whether or not people with different types of brain damage are capable of learning new skills. Other examples include things like driving, riding a bike, and so on. So now we're going to talk about uh, declarative memory. So we're going to talk about this uh, today and for a good majority of this week's lectures. We're going to talk about this type of memory and all of the different disorders that affect it. And this is typically the type we tend to think of when we think about our own memories. So again, some of the best evidence that we have for there being a dissociation between declarative and non-declarative memory, um, or another way to call it explicit and implicit memory, is by looking at people uh, who have amnesia due to damage to the hippocampus. Um, as we are going to talk about for the rest of this lecture, the hippocampus is absolutely critical for explicit memory formation. So what we can do, this is based off of data by Graf, Squire, and Mandler in 1984. So we are looking at amnesics that have hippocampal damage. Uh, we have a control group. Oftentimes these will be either people without brain damage or they will, pe they will be people with uh, brain damage, just not to the hippocampus. So they basically gave these two different groups uh, different types of memory tasks. So uh, they did a task of free recall, which tests explicit memory. So free recall is basically if I asked you to recall, I gave you a list of words, and then I asked you to directly remember and recall um, the words I gave you in any order that you want. So this is a case where you have to consciously go back to the list of words, search through the items, and basically note which ones you remembered. Um, so free recall is a test of explicit memory, and you can see that our control subjects uh, tend to do much, much better than our patients with amnesia. So it's kind of clear that hippocampal damage really hurts explicit memory. Um, now, on the other hand, maybe we do something like word stem completion. So those fill in the blanks that I gave you when you had to fill in the word assassin in the blanks. Um, so this is a test of implicit memory. It is a test kind of related to priming. And we do find that in general, um, there's not really a lot of difference between our two groups. In fact, our amnesic patients do slightly better than our control patients. This is really only a difference of a little bit more than 10%. I don't know if that is a, a significant difference. Um, I'd like to see error bars. But in general, I think this does a really good job of showing that the hippocampus is really critical for for explicit memory, but for our non-declarative memories like learning and conditioning and skills and priming, the hippocampus is not necessary. Um, so by the way, one other thing that I will mention is that with the free recall, there is actually a delay of several minutes or more. If you give people a list of words um, that have hippocampal damage, um, what we'll typically find is if you ask them about the word list right away, 
they'll do a pretty good job. That's short-term memory, and that isn't really affected when you damage the hippocampus. So the delay is really critical. If I test recall immediately, you may not actually see an impairment. So not only do we have a dissociation between explicit and implicit, we also have a dissociation between short-term and long-term memory. So it's kind of clear that the hippocampus seems to be really critical for explicit memory. Probably the best uh, known example of how the hippocampus can really damage your memory uh, is through research on HM. HM is the most a uh, famous patient with memory loss. Um, we didn't really know that much about the hippocampus and its role in human memory at the time. Um, and so he actually had intractable epilepsy. And so one of the ways that they used to actually treat this epilepsy when medicine or other methods really didn't work is they would basically cut away a uh, part of the medial temporal lobe, including the hippocampus. And part of the reason they do this is that for a lot of people that have epilepsy, it's a very, very typical place where seizure activity starts. So the idea is that the seizures would start in the temporal lobes and then it would spread throughout the whole brain. Um, there's a really high concentration of glutamate in the medial temporal lobe. Remember that glutamate is very excitatory and remember that too much excitation is really dangerous for your brain. So this bilateral temporal lobectomy, so they basically removed both of his temporal lobes in the left and the right hemisphere. Um, generally, what they found is that it did actually cure HM's uh, epilepsy, but there were some really important deficits. First of all, um, HM displayed what we call anterograde amnesia. Um, what this means is that he was unable to form new long-term memories. His short-term memory was fine. His long-term memory was impaired. Um, and he also had some retrograde amnesia. Um, so basically, ah, retrograde amnesia is when you lose memory for events that were basically leading up to the surgery. So he did have a little bit of retrograde amnesia. So maybe a couple of months before the surgery, he might have lost that time. But by and large, the biggest byproduct of this lobectomy was his loss of forming new memories. Now this retrograde versus anterograde distinction is actually kind of controversial. Nobody actually disputes the anterograde loss, but some scientists do believe that the hippocampus is just as important for retrieving old memories. Now, what's interesting is that today's surgeries are still performed uh, for the treatment of epilepsy. The temporal lobe still is the most common site, but generally uh, surgeons remove less tissue. They do better assessment of the damaged tissue. And additionally, there are more sophisticated options that can help stimulate the vagus. There are actually pacemakers that can stimulate the vagus nerve and enhance GABA activity to reduce that excitation. Uh, that can lead to seizure activity. So one of the things that's kind of interesting is that generally we find that with more damage, um, more retrograde amnesia results because you are starting to affect regions where memories may actually already be stored. So what we tend to find is that when you form a new memory, um, these memory traces in the brain actually begin to undergo a process called um, consolidation. Um, so one of the things that we find is, so here we have damage to CA1 of the hippocampus. You can see that there is a bit of uh, anterograde amnesia, but no retrograde. If we damage the entire hippocampal formation, um, we again have our anterograde amnesia, but we do also have a 10-year retrograde amnesia. If we have even more extensive damage to the hippocampus, again, we get anterograde amnesia. But if we also cut apart the temporal lobe, we have a 10 to 30-year retrograde amnesia. So this suggests that the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe 
actually bind information um, together, information into events over a period of several years. So when you form a new memory, it is going to take years for that memory to actually have a permanent placement in the brain. It is not an immediate consolidation process. It may take several years for that memory to become so consolidated that it's in the cortex rather than in the medial temporal lobe. And that's what we find that the consolidation process actually does. If a memory trace is sufficiently consolidated in the brain, at some point it will no longer be in the medial temporal lobes. It will be in the cortex where it tends to be more safely stored. So this is kind of part of the reason that um, Alzheimer's disease can be as distressing as it is because initially in Alzheimer's disease you see uh, anterograde memory problems and that's because the first thing that happens is the medial temporal lobe starts to atrophy. At the point where uh, somebody with Alzheimer's is losing memories from their past and forgetting people in their lives, that's because the entire cortex itself is starting to atrophy and that's where a majority of our permanent long-term memories are stored. So it's a, these memories over time become independent of the medial temporal lobe. This is a very gradual process and this consolidation occurs every time a cue triggers a memory. So what I'd like you to do right now is think of your last birthday. Okay, great. I've just triggered you retrieving that memory and because of that, it is now in your working memory and because of that, because you've retrieved it, it is now going through another reconsolidation process to make that memory more permanent. So when I talk about the medial temporal lobe, what do I mean? Well, here is what I mean. So here you can see we've lost kind of part of uh, the hippocampus. Here, we've kind of lost uh, the medial temporal lobe entirely. Um, so let's talk about the differences. So the medial temporal lobe includes the following. It does include the hippocampus, so all of our CA fields, CA1 through CA4, the dentate gyrus, and the sabicular complex. So all of the hippocampus um, and additional areas like the perirhinal cortex, the entorhinal cortex, the parahippocampal cortex, and the amygdala. So if we remove the medial temporal lobe, we are basically getting rid of all of those structures. Um, HM actually had both medial temporal lobes removed more than is actually shown in this picture. And generally, a bilateral lobectomy is not performed if possible because of the massive memory loss that results. So here are the portions of tissue that were excised from HM's medial uh, temporal lobe. So both of these regions were completely removed from HM. So let's talk about what sort of things HM uh, presented with after this bilateral temporal lobectomy. Um, so first of all, as I kind of mentioned, he had a very profound anterograde amnesia. He could not form new long-term memories, but here's what's really critical. This is only for explicit memories. So episodic memories, so memories for events, and then semantic memory, memory for facts. So his anterograde amnesia would be true for uh, all kinds of new information like faces, words, events, things like that. Um, we did, he did present with some moderate retrograde um, amnesia. Again, just as a reminder, this is only for explicit materials. So again, only for events in time, those episodic memories and those semantic memories, those facts. His short-term memory or working memory was intact. Uh, you could ask him a list, you could give him a list of words and then ask them to immediately repeat them back. Um, and he was fine with that. He was also an ex excellent conversationalist. You need to have short-term memory skills to be able to do that. His um, implicit memory 
was intact. He was able to learn new skills. Uh, he did have some learning and conditioning abilities. Um, he did engage in perceptual learning. He could learn to identify and detect faces and objects, very simple tasks. He wouldn't necessarily remember those faces, but he could look at a face and say, yeah, that's a face. Um, and additionally, he did not actually have any intellectual impairments. His intelligence was measured um, by both verbal and reasoning tests, and that was fine. So what have we learned as a result from this? Um, so first of all, short-term and long-term memory are separate systems and different parts of the brain are responsible for short-term memory and different parts are responsible for long-term memory. Um, explicit memories, uh, both semantic and episodic, are not stored uh, in the medial temporal lobe. So the memories that he has already formed, he still had quite a few of those, um, despite some slight retrograde amnesia. So what this means is that if you've already formed a memory and consolidated it, it's not in the medial temporal lobe anymore, it's somewhere else. But if you wanna form a new memory, the medial temporal lobe is critical for explicit learning. He had difficulty learning new, uh, learning about new events and new facts, um, but it is not necessary for most implicit skill, uh, most implicit learning like skills or perceptual learning. So let's talk a little bit about some of the different ways that the medial temporal lobe can actually be damaged. So you'll notice here that I'm using uh, the term focal damage. Focal means localized uh, to one very specific region as opposed to diffuse damage, which you might experience more in things like traumatic brain injury or um, degenerative damage that spreads to other regions like different types of dementia. Now, uh, closer to the end of the semester, we will uh, talk a bit about dementia, but right now we're just gonna focus on these other things that can cause focal damage to the medial temporal lobe. Um, so the first thing that can happen is something uh, we know as a stroke. Um, so let's talk about why stroke in particular can lead to a significant amount of um, medial temporal lobe damage. So what you're looking at here, I'd like you to focus on this yellow artery here. Um, the ring in the center that I'm kind of circling with my mouse is what is referred to as the circle of Willis. Um, it is a very common thing that can happen. So uh, there can be a hemorrhage in this uh, posterior cerebral artery uh, near the circle of Willis. And you can kind of see that it branches all the way out through different parts of the medial temporal lobe. So because of the supply, you can kind of see that this does also venture into portions of the occipital lobe. So if you have a stroke, there is the likelihood that you're not only damaging the medial temporal lobe, but you're also uh, potentially damaging the occipital lobe. Hopefully, um, if you remember our uh, discussion of vision, you would know that this might potentially lead to some visual deficits and possibly even uh, difficulty with uh, seeing due damage to V1. Now, does anybody see anything wrong here? Hopefully, um, don't really worry about those. Those are eyeballs. Um, those are not what's wrong. I hope that you are kind of paying attention to this portion right here. Um, this is basically uh, a medial temporal lobe stroke, again, being kind of based on that posterior cerebral artery in the circle of Willis. Um, generally, this is a unilateral impairment, so it's only in one hemisphere. Generally, they're not going to be as severe as bilateral, so it's possible Possible that the other hemisphere is uh, compensating for damage. Um, now, because this is in the left medial temporal lobe, we do know that uh, because of lateralization of function, um, people who have damage to the left medial temporal lobe will often have difficulty with verbal materials. They might also have damage uh, with respect to uh, comprehension. Uh, here's what this would look like in a post-mortem brain. So here again, uh, we have a medial temporal lobe stroke in the left hemisphere, and you can actually see uh, the scar tissue that has resulted from that damage. And what about here? What's wrong? 
Now in this particular case, you can tell that we have some uh, different intensities in brain tissue that should not be there. Uh, what we are looking at here is a temporal lobe tumor. Uh, somebody that has this type of tumor might present with headaches. Um, and because the tumor is only on one side, the headaches are going to be ipsilateral in nature. So um, it's going to occur on the same side that the tumor resides on. There will possibly also be seizures. Now, the reason that we know that this is a tumor is because the tissue does not match the density of the medial temporal lobe. It also doesn't look like cerebrospinal fluid which is typically black, it definitely doesn't look like white matter, and it doesn't look like gray matter either. Um, now, what can be really tricky about removing uh, brain tumors of this type is that blood vessels can be embedded in it. So when surgeons are trying to remove these kind of tumors, they may potentially want to uh, be careful um, so that way you don't break a blood vessel and run the risk of a hemorrhage or a stroke. So this is a different type of MRI scan. And again, you can kind of see the location of the tumor. It's actually relatively encapsulated um, here within the uh, temporal lobe. Now let's talk about another type of disease that can lead to medial temporal lobe damage, and that is untreated herpes. So um, yes, oop, um, this is the same uh, virus that does cause cold sores. It is the same uh, virus that causes uh, genital um genital herpes as well. Um, now these generally are different strains. Uh, the strain that causes cold sores is definitely different from the strain that causes genital herpes, um, but either strain can actually cause sores in all areas. Now, herpes, um, though incredibly unpleasant in all of its forms, is not life-threatening. Um, generally, there is not a cure for it, but occasionally and very rarely, we're talking about two in uh, 100 million. Um, it can actually spread from the facial nerve or the olfactory nerve uh, to the temporal lobe of the brain, and it can cause what we term encephalitis. Uh, encephalitis can be pretty dangerous. That's because the brain basically becomes inflamed, and because the brain is inflamed and it doesn't really have much of an immune system to fight off a virus, uh, it will start to swell and run up against the bones of the skull. Um, so this can be quite dangerous. Um, usually we will tend to find that this happens uh, in folks that are immunocompromised, uh, people who are, um, for example, Lyme disease, lupus, uh, malaria, or coming off of some type of major illness like cancer or things like that. Um, some of the different symptoms that can be experienced include headache, fevers, seizures, and aphasia. Um, the temporal lobe is highly susceptible susceptible to damage from encephalitis. It has a high concentration of NMDA receptors, and there can be, uh, because of those high concentrations of glutamate receptors, um, the cells can be so excited that they can potentially die. Um, this can lead to permanent damage, and it does potentially lead to death because of either stroke or a potential brain bleed. So here is an example of what this can look like. This is a case where somebody's uh, brain was inflamed and it did actually lead to a stroke. Uh, this is a case of a postmortem brain. You can actually see the areas where uh, damage to uh, the medial temporal lobes has occurred. Uh, you can see that the tissue is very atrophied and very, very weak. Um, now, here is another case. This is severe herpes encephalitis with global atrophy. Uh, this was an older adult. You can tell that we have global atrophy because the brain is very, very almost skeletal in its structure. So this might also be presenting with uh, dementia in this case. And so, folks, that's all I really had. Um, we will talk more about some of the different ways that the medial temporal lobe can be damaged. I will see you very, very soon. Bye.